good. All right, we did pretty good, only 10 minutes late. That's, uh, that's maybe we can try it again next week, improve our time to nine, nine minutes and 30 seconds or something. No, no, thank you so much. Well, uh, welcome to Trinity Church at home, welcome. Uh, we just had a rain shower here in Bolton, so we scrambled inside. Uh, so we're glad that we have options. Well, um, let's just uh, stand for a call to worship, and Tim will lead us in that. And uh, before we begin, if you do not have a bulletin, raise your hand, and Tom Langberg will be happy to give you one. You may need to make paper airplanes for upstairs. All right, keep your hands up. Jane in the back, because we, we may not be able to use the projection today. So unless you have all the songs memorized and you have all the scriptures memorized, you might be needing one of these. Rowan needs one up front. All right. Okay. Tim, take it away. Okay, please join me in our call to worship. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there will be righteousness for everyone who believes. The Lord richly blesses all who call upon him. Call upon him with faith. It is with our hearts that we call upon the Lord, trusting in his atoning sacrifice on the cross for our sins, declaring that Jesus is Lord and believing that God raised Christ from the dead. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of salvation in Christ Jesus. We humble ourselves before you, O oh God, asking that you would graciously pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that your truth may come alive to us, and that we may follow and glorify thee as your chosen people. Amen and amen.
Jesus, we gather here this morning out of rushing and rain and all the things that bring us here, some of those things that fill us with joy, some of those things that fill us with sorrow or longing for you or hurt, um, wherever we are coming from this morning, you gather us up in your arms with the promise of newness, the promise of setting things right, the promise of reconciliation and redemption. We thank you for your open arms and that good gift. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Tim, would you share with us a little bit about Gather Week and uh, in particular about this, uh, 
the prayer walk, drop in prayer walk, what that's all about, and anything else that you'd like to share with us about this coming reunion Sunday and gather week, if you would. Sure, we have a number of things coming up this week. First of all, um, on Thursday morning, I'm not gonna remember all the times, but they're all, they're all printed in the newsletter. Um, there is an open playtime in the nursery for those of you who have kids that have not been in the nursery forever and need some adjustment time with parents before they get left alone. That would be a good time to come and familiarize them with the space and the toys and some friends and that. Thank you, Kirsten. 10 o'clock to 12. 10 o'clock to 12. We'll collaborate. And then in the evening from 6 to 8, um, we'll have a drop-in prayer walk. What that means is there'll be some, um, some papers in the foyer for you to grab, and there'll be some prayer ideas and prompts as you walk around the church, either by yourself or with a group that you bring or a group that you meet here. Um, and the goal of that is just to spend some time focusing our prayer and the different ministries that take place in the different spots in the building. So. When you come into the sanctuary, you can pray for our services, for the safety of people worshiping in here, um, pray for Sunday school when you're down in the Sunday school room, things like that. So that will be a very flexible thing. Come when you want. Um, just to hit one more thing that maybe isn't self-explanatory, the kids' chalk decorating event at 1030 on Saturday, we're just going to have a whole bunch of chalk out and encouraging the kids to put some joy onto the driveway and sidewalk so as people are coming in on Sunday, they're reminded of our young people that love this place as well. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, let's pray. Um, great to have you here. And uh, you can actually see some faces here instead of looking out and seeing sunglasses and other stuff like that. So I'll try not to be too silly. That's a big prayer request right there. <laughs> let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for uh, this place, this sanctuary where we can gather to worship you together with your people. We're grateful for this first Sunday of the month of September, this Labor Day weekend, where we can gather and celebrate the Lord's Supper and break bread together as a church community and to celebrate uh, your death and resurrection for us. Lord, as we come before you in prayer, we Certainly want to pray for those affected um, by Hurricane Ida. We think of those folks in Louisiana that are without water, without power, some of them without homes. Lord, we pray for, for those that are there to, to help care for the people that have lost uh, a great loss of property and those that have lost lives. We also pray for those here in the Northeast that have uh, that have been affected by the floods. We think of this state trooper in Connecticut that died in the floodwaters and seeking to uh, rescue others. We think of people that the billions of dollars of damage done in the middle Atlantic states in through the Northeast as well as the Gulf. Father, hear our prayers for those that are crying out to, to rebuild and that need the basic necessities of life of of food and shelter and uh, protection. Father, as we also pray, we, we want to pray, Lord, that you would uh, grow us as a church community. We're thankful for the plans um, coming up for this Gather Week and Reunion Sunday. We thank you for the opportunities that, uh, that are before us, that we can come together and grow in the grace of Jesus Christ and grow in those that are being saved and, and continue to grow in our relationship as we gather together and celebrate your mercy, celebrate your faithfulness and your goodness and your love and your grace and the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. So Lord, pour out your spirit upon us as we come together for this reunion Sunday and getting ready for the beginning of Sunday school in the week, uh, the week that follows. Father, as we pray, we are thankful for hearing our prayers for the sick, for those recovering in hospital. Father, for those that uh, face various illnesses, uh, thank you, Lord, for your healing hand in answering prayers and for how you're working in, in, uh, in homes and marriages. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mighty hand at work. And Lord, as we, we gather here, we Pray that you'd hear us further as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. The reading from God's Word, beginning in the Old Testament, comes from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 6. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 20. Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in the house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to your feet we wipe off against you. Yet, be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but it would be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Our New Testament reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 26. 1 Corinthians 9. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone 
to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will last, excuse me, that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. You can stay seated as you join me in our hymn story hymn this week, Surely Goodness and Mercy.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that your mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. We thank you for the scripture before us and for this opportunity to hear your word preached. And we pray that you'd give us listening hearts and minds and spirits. We thank you for the blessing that always comes as your word is read and proclaimed. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we're taking up this text from 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 26, with this question in mind, how can we win as many people to salvation as possible? Well, last week in our exposition of the book of 1 Corinthians, we saw how the Apostle Paul had said that those who do the work of preaching the gospel should receive their living from the church where they serve in this great work of God. We also saw how that Paul chose to limit his God-given right to financial support from the community of believers in Corinth so that the work of God would not be hindered. The gospel ministry would not be hindered in any way. Well, Paul chose to limit his freedom and his rights as an apostle and preacher of the gospel for the sake of reaching people for Jesus. Now in the text before us, he continues speaking of his rights as an apostle, saying that he's free and belongs to no one. And yet he voluntarily makes himself a slave to everyone for the purpose of winning as many people to Christ as possible. Imagine now that you say, I choose this path of being a slave or a servant to others so that they may hear and know Christ and be saved. Paul says it this way in verse 20, and we'll put the scripture uh, on, on your screens at home. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. In other words, from a missional perspective, Paul sought to win his fellow Jews to faith in Christ by culturally and socially abiding by the laws and the customs of Judaism in order to win as many Jews to salvation in Christ as possible. Missionary Hudson Taylor followed the example of the Apostle Paul in his pioneer work with China in the China Inland Mission by dressing like the very people that he sought to win to Christ in island China. And we'll put a picture of of him up there for you at home. 1854, 22-year-old Englishman Hudson Taylor made a radical decision. 18 months after arriving in China, he decided to dress in Chinese clothes and grow a pigtail. Well, I don't know about you guys, You know, would you grow a long ponytail or pigtail uh, for the cause of reaching people for Christ? You say, well, there's limits to how far I will go. Well, there was no limits for this man. He decided to dress in Chinese clothes, and his fellow missionaries were, were very critical of him, and some even treated him with contempt. Rather than living in a missionary compound in Shanghai and wearing European clothing, Hudson Taylor decided to live right among the Chinese and adopt their native dress and other aspects of of the indigenous culture. He desired this in order to lessen the cultural barriers uh, to dissemination of the Christian gospel and also to show a high regard for the the, the culture of those he was trying to reach. Hudson Taylor said this, China is not to be won for Christ by quiet, ease-loving men and women. The stamp of men and women we need is such as will put Jesus, China, and souls first, foremost in everything and every time. Even life itself must be secondary. Now, could we say that? Life itself is secondary? You know, we're we're in this pandemic, and so for many of us, it's safety is primary. Well, he said life itself was secondary. What really counts here is reaching people for Christ. And that's what he did, and that's how he lived. 
He mirrored this missional strategy of the Apostle Paul, who in a word contextualized the gospel message. Uh, Zane Pratt, the director of Global Theological Education, the International Mission Board, and uh, used to be at Gordon-Conwell when I was there, said this, contextualization, simply put, is the word we use for the process of making the gospel and the church as much at home as possible in a given cultural context. Paul's missional strategy of the contextualization of the gospel begins by him giving up his valid rights. His passion was to advance the gospel. He didn't want anything to stand in the way of preaching the gospel to people. He was willing to endure any inconvenience or personal hardship that might enable the gospel to spread more effectively, including choosing to not make use of his own legitimate rights. Well, Paul was, secondly, a servant of non-believers. He took this posture of servanthood. Uh, verse 19, he says, though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Now, he's not talking here about serving Christians. I mean, we all like to serve one another, and that's a good thing. And uh, we are to be servants in, in all aspects of our life, and that's part of what we do. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about actually serving those that are not Christ followers in order to reach them for Christ. He takes the posture of a servant. He chose to give up his rights. Paul went further and chose to place himself beneath those whom he's trying to reach as their servant. The posture of a servant reflects the character of Christ. It shadows the stereotypes and causes barriers to drop. Servanthood is an essential characteristic of effective cross-cultural ministry. It defines how we are to make use of our freedom in Christ. What will we do to reach people? What will we do to reach people cross-culturally and you know, in different value systems, in different places? Well, Paul lived, thirdly, like those that he evangelized. He identified with the people he's trying to reach. He ad adapted to their lifestyle as much as he could, without compromising the law of Christ. He didn't, he didn't engage in immoral activity, sexual immorality, oh no. He, he was confined by uh, the limits of Scripture itself. But everything else he could do, uh, he, would, he would do that to reach people. With the weak, those with extra-biblical scruples and hang-ups, he lived with their scruples. He became all things to all people, that by all means he might save some. He identified with the people that he was trying to reach. He adapted his lifestyle to theirs and anything that might hinder them from hearing the gospel. He valued the gospel and their lives more than his own comfort, more than his own culture. Now, sometimes missionaries go into a place and say, I'll make them a little, if you're European, another little European, another British person. If you're American, make them a little American. Oh, no, that's not what we're called to do. Uh, we're called to reach people and, and to evaluate the gospel more than his own culture. If there's any offense in his presentation of the gospel, he wanted the offense to be the cross, not the offense of his foreignness. You know what I'm saying? You know, let, let people be offended by the cross, but not by my foreignness. Paul was under the law of Christ. I was thinking about this at 8 o'clock, and uh, since you know, I'll go off script a little bit here. Um, and I was thinking about the days when Susan and I went to India, and we were called to go into villages and, and eat with our hands. And I said, listen, I was raised better than that. My mother taught me to wash your hands before supper and use your fork in your left hand and your spoon in your right hand, proper etiquette. There's no way I'm going to eat with my hand. They said, well, first of all, you have to eat with your right hand. You can't eat with your left hand. Didn't matter if you're left-handed, that was the culture. So it was sort of like, wow, why do we have to do this? Well, we're not doing it to try to make them a little Americans. We're trying to reach them. And any barriers that, that can, can, can stop people, we are willing to do that. When we were in Uganda, uh, they had the, the practice of eating at 9 o'clock at night. I went, I'm not eating at 9 o'clock. I eat at 5 o'clock, 
6 o'clock at the latest. There's no way I can make it to 9 o'clock. Well, Herb Cook said, well, you know, you'll be eating alone because here in our culture, uh, they come at 9 o'clock and they have a big meal and they hang out and that's what we're going to do because that's what they do in our culture. I went, I don't know. Can't we change them? Maybe they could change their schedule to mine. He said, that's not the way it works. We change our schedule to theirs because we're, we're seeking to reach them. In some of the rural, rural areas, they ate uh, flying ants. I went, listen, there's no way I'm putting a bug in these teeth of mine. No way. So the, the, why would I eat a bug when there's a good papaya or banana or a mango waiting to be eaten? I don't need to eat these bugs. They said, well, this is something that they consider a delicacy. And so if they offer you a bowl of these flying bugs, you eat it with gratitude in your heart. He said, well, wait a minute now. That's not what we do in America. You're not in America. <laughs> You're in Uganda, and you're in a certain part of the area. And so what you do, you do what you need to do in order to reach them for Christ. Well, one final illustration. In, in Kampala, the women wore long dresses to their ankles. And some of the young ladies from America said, I'm not wearing a dress. I don't wear dresses. That's not something I do. And I'm not going to wear a dress to my ankles. And our missionary said, well, you'll be staying at home then. Well, what do you mean? I came here to America to preach the gospel. Well, we're glad you're here. Get a dress. You're going to wear a dress. It's going to go to your ankles. Well, why? You're not, an, you're not here to be a little American. You're here to minister to the people. This is the culture, you see. And so this is exactly what Paul does here. He becomes all things, all men, so as to win them. So we have to ask the question, what are we willing to do in order to reach lost people for Christ? The fact that we are to contextualize the gospel doesn't mean only in another country. We are to contextualize it here in America for people that are atheist, people that are agnostics, people that, have no, that did not grow up in the church, that don't have a church background, you see. What will we do to reach them for Jesus Christ? Well, Paul, he was under the law of Christ. He stayed within the bounds of Scripture. In the middle of his statement on identification, he inserts the all-important parenthesis, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. He was free from both the requirements of keeping the ceremonial law of Judaism, um, but he still very much regarded himself as under the authority of God expressed in the, his word in Scripture. The boundaries were set for him by Scripture itself. The gospel can and should be at home in every culture. We must identify with those we're trying to reach, adapt to their culture, no matter what discomfort it causes us. However, the gospel also challenges and condemns every culture at some point. Where the Bible draws a line, we must draw a line. The goal of contextualization is not comfort, but clarity. That's the goal. The gospel will never be comfortable to any fallen society or to any sinful human being. So we don't want to make it so, you know, well, we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. Well, the fact is, the, there will be discomfort with the cross. Our goal is to make sure that we do not put any obstacles in the way of the gospel itself. We'll put this, uh, this PowerPoint up for you at home. The goal of a Christian is to be inoffensive in every way except in the matter of the cross. The message of the cross of Christ naturally gives offense, but we can't water down the gospel. The preaching of the cross will be foolishness to those who are perishing. Well, for Paul, the life of a Jew was not a foreign life to him. It was his heritage. Philippians 3.5 says that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin, where once the law was his taskmaster, now the law of Moses was not driving him, but the law of Christ, the law of the love of Jesus, and his love for the Jewish people. Many parts in Scripture he says about his love for the Jewish people, and one of those is Romans 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. 
For I wish that I myself were cursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So you see, here there's this burden for the Jewish people, but he also had a burden for Gentiles as well. Paul continues and says this, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul complied with their customs. He conformed with their dress, his diet, his habit, his manner of life. He he abstained from foods which they deemed their duty to abstain from. Paul's example should teach us to make uh, the main business of life not to gratify ourselves or to make ourselves comfortable, uh, not to offend where we'll do no good, but truth will offend. We cannot help it. But in matters of ceremony and dress and customs and forms and and so forth, uh, we must bear that all in mind for the sole purpose of saving their souls. Now, what does it mean to become all things to all people so we may save some? Well, several things. One, it means to not putting up a stumbling block to people to receive the gospel. Here's an example. It may not be a good one, but it's the one I came up with. (laughs) If your neighbor takes pride in his or her lawn, and it's not a priority for you. For you, you like the wild and woolly look. You like things natural, okay? And you like things uh, with little critters running around and, and all kinds of things. But for your neighbor, it, 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 it's a stumbling block that he looks across the, the street and he sees your lawn that's not looking manicured. What would you do? to win your neighbor to Christ. Well, no, wait a minute now. You're getting personal with me. Well, it is a personal thing. We have to ask the question, what will I do? Not that we become suddenly lovers of grass this high. Oh, no. We become lovers of our neighbor. And so we think, what can we do to love someone? It's probably not a great example, but I think it gets the point across. Secondly, It means a willingness to change one's behavior, setting aside one's own rights in order to lead as many people to salvation in Christ. It does not mean that we are to compromise with the world in order to fit in, to live worldly or carnal lives. Some have used Paul's statement here wrongly, saying I've become all things to all people as an excuse to live a worldly life. Well, my neighbor's so worldly, I guess that's what I need to do. I need to become totally worldly, totally materialistic in order to to win my neighbor for Christ. No, why not? Because the rest of scripture gives us a moral standard of how then shall we live. And so we can't just sort of sell out, as it were, to worldliness. Or uh, we must be willing to forego traditions and familiar comforts in order to reach any audience, Jewish or non-Jewish. Here's an example. When Paul was in Athens, he's surrounded by all of these idols. Now, maybe you would say, let's go on an idol-smashing campaign and just say, you know, what is wrong with you people? These idols are are, are an abomination to God. You You know, don't you know it says you should have no other graven images and go on this great holy terror ripping them all up and smashing them. Well, that was not his approach. When he was in Athens, Paul established rapport with the Greeks before telling them about Jesus. He stood amidst their many idols and commented in Acts 17, 22 about their devotion to gods. He was seeking common ground with them, first of all. Rather than rail against the idolatry of Athens, he used those symbols of pagan pride to gain their attention and say, ah, I see that you are, have many idols around here. I see you're very devoted to these things. And, and then he used for common ground to, to be able to preach the gospel to them. He never bragged about his credentials, but if pertinent information would give him credibility with a specific audience, he did what he, what he would do. He, he was a Roman citizen, but he didn't go around with that on his chest saying, I'm a Roman citizen. He just said, I am a Roman citizen, until he was arrested and was treated wrongly. And still, by the way, did you know I was a Roman citizen? What? You're a Roman citizen? 
and he had common ground to be able to speak with them. He knew how to behave in a Hebrew household, but he could dispense with the cultural Jewish traditions when he was in a Greek household. He could literally be all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. There are several ways we can become all things to all people. First of all, by extending courtesy to another, by listening to them. Uh, many times we're too often to share our own thoughts, especially when we know the other person needs to hear about Jesus. One common mistake that often is made is to jump into a conversation before we really hear what the other person is saying. We all appreciate being heard. When we extend courtesy to another person, he or she is more likely to listen to what we have to say. Listening first, the other person becomes an individual we care about rather than simply a mission field that we need to conquer. This is a person. We care about them. We're going to listen to them. I understand where they're coming from and not judge them, but listen carefully and lovingly, you see. Be kind and respectful of others. This should go without saying. But unfortunately, we can forget kindness in the passion of the moment, especially if something comes across uh, our, our computer screen and someone says something and we're commenting about something they said about a, an issue. Uh, and, and where's kindness and where's respect? It gets out the window. There's never an excuse to make rude or hate-filled comments. Getting in the last word does not mean that we won the argument. We earn the person's respect. Kindness and respect never go out of style and always are appropriate regardless of the subject matter. Thirdly, extending sensitivity to the culture of those you're seeking to reach. Trained missionaries know before they can reach a cultural group, they must understand the particulars of their culture. Same is true of every believer, even if we never leave our own city. Some years ago, I was called to be a, a, a missionary in Western Pennsylvania to reach a youth for Christ, with Youth for Christ. And I said, well, you know, I don't know what they're into. I don't know what music they listen to. I don't know what activities they like. I don't know if they like roller skating or maybe they like rollerblading or they don't like any of those things. I don't know what songs they listen to. I don't know what activities they like to listen to. Well, there was a group I was trying to reach in a certain community and they were into war games. Well, I wasn't into war games, but they, they loved these war games. And, and what they would do, they'd dress up in camo and they'd paint their faces and they'd go out in and, and, and some, uh, some remote area and they and would play war games with one another. I said, you know, I'm not sure about this. And then it's like, well, do you want to reach these people for Christ? You better go out there and play some war games. And I said, all right, tell me how this works. He said, well, it's this game called Catcher the, Capture the Flag, and we, we put this little radar station on top of a hill or someplace, and we hide it, and we work together as teams, and we got little flags and so forth. I said, all right, well, we can do that. We did that. And after we did that for a whole day, we sat down, and I preached the gospel. Then they were ready because I identified with them something that was important to them. And then... And people aren't going to listen to what you have to say about Christ if you don't care about them or care about the things that they like to do. Well, fourthly, deal with prejudice and repent of judgmental attitudes and lack of love. Prejudice of every kind has been part of human history since the beginning. Despite how hard we try, we carry all forms of prejudice against certain other people. Ironically, even those who denounce prejudice of any sort are usually quite prejudiced against those that they consider prejudiced. <laughs> oh, you know, you're prejudiced. I, I, I can't stand you. You're, you're a bigot. I can't, you know, and are prejudiced against them. Well, we need to repent of judgmental attitudes and lack of love. Paul had to repent of that. He was a Jew. He looked down his nose at Gentiles. He looked down at these people. He didn't love them. He wanted to be separate from them. He needed to repent of that attitude in order to reach them, and he did. And that's the same thing for us as well. As a former Pharisee, he had to deal with his own prejudice. Jesus warned us not to be shocked when the world hates us. It hated him first, John 15, 18. Our message is offensive to human pride and contradicts the sin nature, so our behavior and attitude should not give an offense. Well, Paul goes on here in the text and says this. 
Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Winning people for Christ takes discipline. Discipline in your study habits. Discipline in your prayer life. Discipline in your reading habits. Discipline in your worship habits. One of the pitfalls of this pandemic is that we become undisciplined in our worship habits. Are you listening? We do. It's human nature. Human nature. It's part, part of the laws of thermodynamics. Okay? If you have any questions on that, Wesley will explain it to you. Something about everything going towards disorder. And the fact is we don't drive towards discipline and order in our lives. And so the same thing is true spiritually, that we can fall into habits that we're no longer disciplined in our study, in our prayer, in our worship, and in our witnessing, in our witnessing. Sometimes we say, well, the safe thing to do is not deal with anyone face to face. And we become lazy when it comes with, with sharing Christ face to face with a person. We've been conditioned that we need to distance ourselves to be safe. And the carryover is this discipline uh, sometimes of, of uh, avoiding weekly corporate worship, whether at home, at lo- online, or in person. We need to keep it up, keep, keep attending services at home or here, and that we're part of this community of faith, that it is a priority. Now, taking a running analogy, Paul says to run to win. A successful athlete is obsessed with winning. Now, here's here's the time for you to participate in the sermon. Who do you know is obsessed with winning? Tom Brady. I would agree with that. LeBron James. I would agree with that. Who else is obsessed with winning? You can mention yourself if you are. It's all right. Or someone else. Who else? Well, a successful athlete is obsessed with winning. In order to win, they, they adopt a strong work ethic, a strong disciplined lifestyle, great eating habits, great exercise regiments. Take great runners like marathon gold medalists from Kenya, Kenyan runner Iliud Kipchoge. Uh, There's a picture of him for you at home. Uh, 2021 Olympics, he won the gold medal. He was a repeat. He also won back in Rio in 2016. He is the world record holder for the marathon at 201.39. Imagine, two hours and one minute and 39 seconds. I couldn't ride a bicycle in that, that time period. I can barely drive that fast, all right? Imagine, to do... A marathon, two hours and one second in the Berlin uh, Marathon in 2018. He's obsessed with winning. Now, the fact is, the Apostle Paul was obsessed with winning. Five times in this text, he uses the word win, 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 win. Count them. Five times in this short text, he says, I want to win people for Christ. He was not trying to win a a gold medal or a a wreath on his head, but to to win people for Christ. So just to recap, how can we win as many people to salvation as possible? One, by embracing a philosophy like the Apostle Paul, becoming all things to all people, by some means we might save some, contextualizing the gospel to those that we seek to win. Secondly, keeping a championship mindset like Tom Brady, like LeBron James and others. Keep a championship mindset. I'm going to run the race of faith, seeking to win as many people to the Lord as possible. Thirdly, living a life of discipline. In our Bible study, in our prayer lives, our worship, corporately and individually, have good godly disciplines in our life. Fourthly, taking up the law of Christ. 
by serving others in love. I will serve uh, others that they would come to know Christ. Fifthly, giving no offense to others in our actions and words, not compromising the faith, measuring our lives up against the standard of Holy Scripture, but coming across to people with, with respect and kindness and not offensively. Sixthly, it means taking the time to be quick to listen, slow to speak, treat, treating, people, treating people with respect. And finally, by giving no offense to others except the cross of Christ, which promises to be a stumbling block to others. May God give us such a strategy to win people for Christ or Trinity, to win as many people as possible. When the 72 disciples came back from their preaching the gospel, Jesus said, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Imagine now the power to overcome the enemy. That's the enemy of Satan. Rejoice not that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We can rejoice that our names are written in heaven and we must go and to reach people for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this example of the Apostle Paul and this exhortation to us today as we reflect upon his commitment uh, to reach people for Christ. We, we all realize there's much room for improvement in our lives. Help us, Lord. Show us where you want us to change. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us this winning mindset, knowing that it is by your grace that anyone is saved. Your grace through faith is not of ourselves that we can boast, but, Lord, we have our part as your ambassadors. Help us to do what you command us to do and give us that faith that Lives will be transformed by the power of the gospel. In your name we pray, amen.
as high as the heavens are up above. So is the greatness of his love, as far as the east is from the west. He removes our sin from us, far as the east is from the west. 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 Let's join together in the uh, affirmation of our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again, he ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father. He'll come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Two scriptures I'd like to read as we prepare our hearts to receive communion today. And one is from the Psalms, the Psalm of David, and this is a, a messianic psalm that speaks prophetically of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel, and you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and, you, and were saved, and you they trusted and were not appointed. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Goes on down and says this in verse 14, I'm poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. A clear prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus and his suffering on the cross. And then Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you're not be pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will. And so Jesus embraced the will of the Father to go to the cross for us, to pay the penalty that we could not pay to bring lasting forgiveness of sin and cleansing from all our sin. Imagine, that's what we are remembering here. We're not reenacting the crucifixion of Christ. We're remembering that finished work that he did on Calvary's cross. Let's prepare our hearts to receive communion. Father, we thank you for these elements before us, this cup of the new covenant, this cup of juice that symbolizes the blood of Jesus that atones and cleanses from all sin. This bread, this unleavened bread, that speaks to us of, of the blameless, sinless body of Jesus Christ, the very bread of life who went to the cross for us so that the wrath of God may be satisfied in the punishment poured out upon his son so that we can be saved from the wrath of God to come. Lord, may we not take for granted 
the righteousness that you have imputed and imparted to us. May we not take for granted that we've been robed in the righteousness of Christ. While your grace provides this, nothing we can deserve or earn. May we see that the, the cost of that was the very death and crucifixion of Jesus upon the cross for our sins. We remember today as we celebrate together the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Sanctify now these elements for this holy purpose, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you would like gluten-free bread, Tom Langberg, he switched it. That is Frank. Oh, both Frank and Tom have gluten-free bread. And if you'd like gluten-free bread here, I will be the one serving that. So raise your hand. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, turned to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Let us eat with thankful hearts and with faith.
and string together the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood. Well, Pastor Eric Wilder is back from his sabbatical, and he is upstairs doing the switching. I want to ask Eric if you could stand where you are and just give a prayer or blessing uh, for us, if you could. And uh, let's welcome Eric and Eileen back.
cover of our bulletins, it has that scripture that we were referring to. There's a young man that is, that is prostrate on the ground. It says, I become all things to all people that by some means I might save some. Shows commitment. Shows our willingness to surrender. To do all that you can do to reach someone for Christ. Well, Paul, later on in the second letter of Corinthians, said this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. This is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We therefore are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Don't receive his grace in vain. Be an ambassador for him. Implore people to be reconciled to Christ. And what we can do is pray. We can do share Christ face to face. And we can invite people to come to this church. And next week is a great opportunity to do that. If you're looking for a good week to invite someone, next week is a great week. And I hope that you do that. Receive now the benediction. Now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all those whom you love. In Christ's name, amen.